Zero. India blasts off into space with cutting-edge satellite technology. But the United States is putting the brakes on its space program. So, is there a new space race? And if so, who's winning it? This is Inside Story. Hi there, welcome to the program, I'm Hamish McDonald. In Star Trek they say that space is the final frontier, but if you believe his critics, Barack Obama isn't much interested in space. He's cutting back NASA and letting other countries streak ahead. Space was always the domain of the United States and Russia. Today though it's developing economies like China and India that are really blasting off. Thursday sees the Indian Space Agency take a major step forward in its program. But on the same day in Florida, President Obama is expected to call time on one of NASA's flagship programs. So on today's show, are we seeing the start of a new kind of space race? And who are the big players? Nia Tucker reports. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Space travel was always part of the great American dream. For years, the U.S. remained at the forefront of a new frontier. But today, that dream has taken a backseat. The world is facing a crippling economic crisis, and the U.S. is responding by scaling back on its space program, a move that has left some unhappy. Uh, I think in a number of the agencies, there was room made for exciting new programs by reducing or phasing out programs that were regarded as lower priority or lower performing. And of course, it is to be expected that the people who've been running those programs probably don't agree. As Obama announces his plans for NASA Good on morning, Thursday, everybody. India is getting ready to launch its first satellite powered by a cryogenic rocket. It's a technology previously denied to them. After two decades of research, India is launching with a bang. Three, two, one. Yes. It's a landmark mission for India, pegged to make the country completely self-reliant in space travel. If successful, it will join an elite club of nations including the US, Russia, France, Japan and China. But India is not the only developing country making it to space. Brazil and Malaysia are not too far behind. Both send manned rockets in recent years. With such countries pouring money into space technology, aiming for the stars is no longer just the American dream. Neha Tucker for Inside Story. Well, that's where we'll begin our debate today. Joining us from New York is Don Isles, a former NASA engineer who worked on the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. In New Delhi, we're joined by Pala Bugler, the science editor at India's NDTV. And Lord Christopher Monckton joins us from Washington, D.C., where he's the chief policy advisor to the Science and Public Policy Institute in Washington. He's also the former science advisor to Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom. All right, let's start in our, with our guest in New York, Don Isles. You were critical of the Bush administration and its policies with regards to NASA, saying that their proposals were speculative and they cost uh, enormous amounts of money. You must therefore be quite happy to see Barack Obama taking the steps that he's taking now. I would be happier if the United States had a vigorous, strong space program, uh, but I think it's wrong to say that we had that under the previous administration. We had ambitious goals, but there was never adequate funding for those. And so at least with the Obama program, we have an honest space program, and perhaps we can build from there and uh, see the, uh, the, the days of real important exploration again resume after, after a lull. But you think it's the right thing to do right now? Uh, I think President Obama was faced with the choice of giving major new resources to NASA to support promises that were made by other people or to look at the picture again and to perhaps shuffle the deck. And I think he did that. Uh, I think in a sense the United States will be a, uh, a number three in space for a period of time because both the Russians and the Chinese retain a man capability and we will not have that back for at least seven years probably. Uh, but that seven-year gap during which will be dependent upon Russian spacecraft to reach the space station, that already existed. That's not something that's being created by the Obama policies. It already existed. 
And I think this law gives a reasonable chance uh, to commercial companies to provide a transportation capability, a manned transportation capability to Earth orbit, uh, which is something that had to happen at some point in the evolution of space travel. And I think now is perhaps the right time to do it. Uh, I applaud one feature of the Obama plan particularly, which is the decision not to abandon the space station after only five years of completed operation. All right, uh, let's go over to uh, Lord Moncton. You've been critical of Barack Obama, but as we just heard there, it's not really his fault. Well, I think it's very difficult for an incoming president faced with the economic circumstances he did face. But he made, I think, a mistake by retasking NASA in the stimulus package as being chiefly a climate change monitoring agency rather than a full-blown space exploration agency. And he's therefore compounded the errors of previous administrations in not making sure that a manned capability was retained when the shuttle reached, reached the end of its useful life. But what, we're sorry and to interrupt, but why, why is that a mistake? Climate change is probably the single biggest threat facing the planet today. It has long been said that we're interested in space because of energy needs. Surely it chimes well uh, with the mission of NASA uh, to include climate change as well. I think to include it is fair enough. Uh, that's if you think that climate change is a, a major short-term problem, which uh, I don't and a growing number of scientists don't. But um, I think the, it has distorted the funding pattern for NASA. And one of the things that I'm expecting President Obama to do in his announcement tomorrow is to announce major new funding for the space aspects of what NASA is doing, the exploration aspects, and perhaps even lay the foundations for our first reach out to Mars. All right, uh, let's go over to Palo Bagla in India because essentially this is where the developing world comes in. This is an enormous opportunity, is it not, for countries like yours? Oh, it is indeed an enormous opportunity and India is casting its net wide. The launch which will happen tomorrow is a landmark launch. For the first time, India will put a, GS, a geosynchronous satellite in its orbit using a completely Indian-made vehicle. It also is a smack in the face of America because this was the technology which India needed in the 1990s and was denied by Americans putting pressure on Russia. So when India does it tomorrow, it really shows end-to-end -end capability for the Indian space program, at least in the space launch market. Don Isles, is this a smack in the face for America, India, uh, launching off into space with the technology, the very technology that you denied it? Uh, I don't see it as a smack in the face, and I don't know enough about the old history of that denial to, uh, to either defend it or uh, condemn it. But I congratulate the Indians on this upcoming launch and the, uh, the uh, anticipated success of their new cryogenic stage. Do you think the reality is, though, that the U.S. has to cede its supremacy in space to other countries today? Uh, there have been lulls in the past in the American space program, and you could argue that during those lulls uh, we, were, we, we sacrificed our supremacy. I think this is a long-range sort of decision. Uh, I believe the commercial world will rise to the occasion and will provide a capability. Uh, and I also believe that there is a focus in the Obama space program on objectives beyond Earth orbit. In fact, my understanding is, uh, perhaps this awaits tomorrow's speech, that the uh, development of the heavy lift capability, which is necessary to support missions away, b missions beyond Earth orbit, that that's actually being accelerated a bit in the Obama program. Okay, but so you, sorry to interrupt think, you, but uh, I mean, you wrote recently in an essay that you thought that the U.S. manned space program was, in your words, dead in the water. That doesn't sound like a lull. I wrote that in 2005, and uh, that's how I saw it at the time. I see this as being a uh, almost a catharsis, sort of a return to basics, a return to honesty. And so I'm uh, somewhat more optimistic today than I was then. Lord Moncton, isn't it true that NASA and the U.S. space program needs to get with the reality, ha have a better relationship with the public and show the public what it's doing and what all of this money is producing for the general population? 
That's a very shrewd point, and I think uh, one thing one could look at is the launch capability that uh, Palab was mentioning a moment ago, and so was Don Isles. The problem is that the gravity well of the Earth is very considerable, and the methods that have been used up until now of overcoming it have been much more expensive than they need to be. I mean, one looks at commercial enterprises like Virgin Galactic, where they're going to be able to piggyback a small space plane on a conventional aircraft to get it up to the upper troposphere. The space plane then kicks itself into orbit from there and can do a controlled descent which means you don't have to have these complex heat shielding tiles that the um, space shuttle has had to have. This is going to greatly reduce the cost of getting into space and also increase the safety of getting into and back out of space again. And I think that what we're now going to see is that because NASA has been, to some extent, a rather clunky, nationalized industry, using endless dollops of taxpayers' funding and therefore not having to think out what is the most cost-effective solution, the contribution of commercial enterprises in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world to try to keep pace with the pace setters who are now China and India. And I, too, congratulate India on tomorrow's launch and pray that it goes as, as well as we all hope. I think these commercial enterprises are now going to increasingly take the load from NASA, which I think is going to become largely irrelevant in future years, except perhaps for developing the very expensive very long distance space capability which is probably beyond the capacity of the private sector to fund at the moment. Okay, why then are you being so critical which is far, of Barack Obama? makes NASA far from irrelevant. Why then are you being so critical of Barack Obama? Because it sounds like you think the involvement of the commercial sector is a good thing. I think the involvement of the commercial sector is an excellent thing, and my criticism of Barack Obama uh, relates to the diversion of NASA's mission away from the exploration of space and towards climate change monitoring at a time when it is becoming plainer after 15 years with no statistically significant global warming that global warming is not the, the problem that it was originally thought to be. We're just not seeing the warming that has been predicted by the UN and its fellow travelers in the climate extremist industry. Those days well, are over. Part, part and I think you misread the signals on that. Uh, Don Oz, please uh, go ahead. I, I, th I think interpreting NASA's new mission as nothing more than climate monitoring is a, a, a great distortion. And I think uh, you, you, you make my point for me, because it's necessary for us to un understand the effects that we characterize as climate warning and understand whether they are a serious problem or not. And if that's a mission Nas NASA can help with, uh, then go for it. But I disagree that so this uh, policy, per se, redirects NASA away from the ambitious goals. Lord Moncton? I think those goals well, are I still there. You. I think everybody involved with spacecraft... Then, then I... Well... Don, with respect, but if, if commercial uh, the launches stimulus were package issue, is very then, explicitly then look worded. What's happening from India. Let's just uh, hear if what Lord Moncton has to say, and then we'll go over to Delhi. Yeah. Uh, the stimulus package is very clear. Both NASA and NOAA are both retasked to be primarily climate change monitoring agencies. The language of the Stimulus Package Act is entirely clear on that point. That is what the administration at that time had in mind. Now, I think that tomorrow we will see a shift because it is becoming apparent to Barack Obama that not only is the science not panning out as the extremists had predicted, we're just not getting the warming that was predicted, nor are we likely to do so, but also the general public have gone off the idea of climate change as being the most significant and terrible problem that we face. And he is, I think, to some extent, responding to that by shifting back the, the okay. tasking of NASA uh, so that less of it will be devoted to climate, more to getting into long-distance space exploration, which is what well, I think okay, NASA Lord should Mungden, now be all I, I want about. to give our guest in Delhi a chance to, to comment on that. Paula Bugler, uh, you were trying to interject there with some thoughts. Yes. See, what Lord Monington is saying is important, and we, we should not forget the big Himalayan blunder which happened by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, let's come back to the issue of, of launchers. If you look at costs, the Indian launcher costs are half of what the world market costs. And in future, if India steps in as a major contributor, especially for smaller payloads, 
it would be a fantastic opportunity for the world to reduce costs. Also, one has to see, just yesterday, the Indian Space Research Program chairman told me that India is going to be launching its human space flight program in the next seven years, which means launching two humans into a low Earth orbit in the next seven years. While all this is happening, India is not forgetting looking at issues of climate change, trying to find water, not just on moon as the Indian mission Chandrayaan-1 did, the maiden mission to the moon, but also trying to find water for agriculture, for people, the poor people in India. So the focus in India, in the Indian Space Research Program, is strongly both look at interplanetary missions, look at remote sensing and opportunities on the Earth, but access to space will always be decided by national priorities, and India does not want to lose that focus. Don, I was interested to uh, get your thoughts on this. Do you think that part of the problem here is that the aerospace industry effectively sees itself either against or in opposition to, or at least separate from, the whole issue of climate change? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily so. That 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 may be. Uh, I think those industries have a part to play in the in the climate change issue. If if in fact uh, technologically oriented steps need to be made, I like the, to make the point that the civilian space program does have a role to play in, shall we say, pumping technology that originated in the military sector in which a lot of the same companies are involved, but perhaps the space program has the function of pumping some of that technology into the civilian sector. I think that's one of the great things about the space program, uh, that the creativity, the enormous creativity that's gone into the making of weapons systems, uh, which by, the, by itself, that drain on creativity has done harm to the space program and to the nation, uh, that the space program can help uh, correct that tendency. Uh, but doesn't it make can NASA and other uh, space... Sorry, just, just to get one more uh, question, though, to Don Isles, if I can. Doesn't it make yeah. NASA and space programs more relevant if you do connect it to an issue like climate change? Isn't it ultimately quite a smart thing, uh, what Obama is doing now? I think that is smart, and uh, I also think uh, that the point you've made indirectly is that it does depend upon the public sentiment. If the public sentiment were there for funding a very ambitious government-run space program, uh, a la Apollo, then uh, I believe we would have that program. But I don't see that sentiment there. It's only now with this Obama uh, issue, this Obama, new Obama space plan, that people have become conscious of the fact that we're going to be dependent upon Russian Soyuz spacecraft, a very old spacecraft, to reach the space station. But that's been a perceivable fact now for, you know, five or more years. All right, Lord Moncton, I think you were wanting to say something then. Go ahead. Yes, very briefly, on the strategic side of this, I think the United States, over several administrations, has made the mistake of allowing this gap in manned missions to arise, and I don't blame the president, current president for this. He was landed with this situation when he took office. But it is serious that America can't get men up into space to adjust their military satellites, for in instance, and the fact that they've now got to depend on countries such as Russia, with whom uh, relations can still be rather frosty, is clearly something of major concern. And my own opinion would be that they should, in the United States, take very good care to make sure that this gap in manned capability is as short as possible. And perhaps if <coughs> India is willing to share her technology for doing the uh, launches at half the price that NASA can do them for, uh, even though America has not always shared technology with India, perhaps that will help NASA to get uh, men back into space so as not to lose the strategic capability. Much of my time uh, working with the United States when I worked for Margaret Thatcher was on the strategic defense initiative, and it became quite clear that just by putting satellites into space and not putting men there, some pretty horrifying mistakes could arise. At one point, they tried to bounce a laser off a satellite, but they'd programmed the height of the laser above the ground as 10,000 miles instead of on the top of a mountain at 10,000 feet, and the laser not not surprisingly, completely missed 
And they need to have manned presence in space, and I think from now on a continuous manned presence in space to maintain <coughs> full security, and I don't see that happening at the moment. Pala Bagla in Delhi, is that a realistic scenario? I, I, oh, it definitely is. India is committing major resources to the tune of several billion dollars for a manned space program. And, and they don't call it man, they call it a human space program. So because India right. is investing very heavily and looking... But, but my question is, is it, from the is, it, is it a realistic the scenario Earth. whereby the United States might effectively outsource some of its uh, space taxi services, if you like, uh, to India? Well, India certainly would be very happy to do that if that happens. Now, what is the option in front of America? The, the, the space shuttle is going to be retired soon. You're left with the Russians or the Chinese. And in a few years from now, the Indian program would come up. Obviously, the Chinese would not be a very, very viable option for the, for the Americans to go that route. So the option would be to come to India at some point. And last, when I interviewed the administrator of NASA, I had asked him, will India and America be willing to go to the moon together? And he said it, would, it could be, well, a possibility in the future that they could join hands and undertake missions to the moon. All right, Don Isles, you worked on the Apollo 11 mission. I guess of all of us, you've been uh, the closest to space. So maybe I can give the final thought to you. What do you think about that scenario? The US effectively uh, scaling down its own operations and, and uh, outsourcing it to other countries. Do you think that might happen in the future? Uh, I think there's certainly a potential for that. We're outsourcing launch services to Russia right now, or we're uh, anticipating doing that. Um, American astronauts have traveled to space in the Russian Soyuz, and I see no reason why, uh, when it becomes sufficiently mature, uh, we could not send astronauts to the space station or to low Earth orbit in an Indian spacecraft. I see no contradiction there. Uh, back to a previous point, and perhaps this, this touches on the Indian question also, I agree uh, that it's very important that the administration be energetic in fostering the commercial efforts that are going to get us back a uh, Earth orbit capability. I think that's very important. I think the fact that that development is gonna, not going to be intimately led by NASA uh, doesn't alter the fact that the government does need to be involved as a stimulator and as a monitor and as a, uh, a means of transmitting uh, to the commercial world the lessons that have been learned by NASA. All right, excellent. We'll and have that, to leave in fact, is one of NASA's back, uh, historic back roles. We get a new term if, right. you, if you look at it. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there. It's a fantastic discussion that we're having here today. All right, we'll thank our guests for joining us on this edition of Inside Story in New York. Don Isles, a former NASA engineer in New Delhi. Pala Buglet, the science editor at India's NDTV. And from our Washington studio, Lord Christopher Monckton, a former advisor to Margaret Thatcher. A fascinating debate, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. As always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Email them to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. From me and the whole team here at Inside Story, we'll see you next time.